Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. Each of the four Gospels in the New Testament record an independent account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in Luke chapter 24, we get the account in this gospel, and we're not looking at the whole account. We're just looking at one, one part of it, and we read about it in Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49, and this is what God says. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would show us a resurrected Jesus. I pray this morning that you would clothe us with power from on high. And Father, I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. An historical fact that involves a resurrection from the dead is utterly inconceivable. Let me say that again. An historical fact 
that involves a resurrection from the dead is utterly inconceivable. That is a quote from a famous German scholar in the last century. His name was Rudolf Bultmann. And Bultmann had a fascinating perspective about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bultmann argued that if you are going to be a Christian, you have to believe in this thing called the resurrection. He said there's no such thing as Christianity without a resurrection from the dead. So he believed that the resurrection was crucial to Christianity, but he didn't think the resurrection was true. His argument, in other words, was if you want to be a good Christian, you you have to believe in the resurrection. But what that means is that being a Christian means having confidence in something that didn't actually happen because it's inconceivable that something like the resurrection from the dead could be true. So to be a good Christian, you have to believe things that aren't true. You have to believe a resurrection that never happened. Now, Boltmann is this famous scholar in the academic world that most of you in this room have probably never heard of. But his argument is what most people believe, that the resurrection is important for Christianity But this most important reality in Christianity just isn't true. So if you're going to be a good Christian, you got to believe things that aren't true. you got to believe a resurrection that never happened. And the reason most people believe that is because the resurrection is hard to believe. In, In the world we live in that is defined, defined now by death, We live in a world that's defined by death. Every single person in this room is marching towards a great, high, thick, impenetrable wall, and it is death. We all know what's coming. We get a little weaker every day. We get a little more tired every day. Our bodies are breaking down. We see the people that we know and love depart to this place called death. We know it's coming, and in that world that is defined by death, a person that would cross that wall and then come back and defeat that wall of death, it's just a hard thing to believe. It's not just hard for famous academics, and it's not just hard for many of you. It's hard for the very first disciples. We just read about this. We we're we read about Jesus dying on the cross. We read about Jesus being placed in a grave. And now that dead and buried man is standing in front of the disciples who knew him best. And the description of what they do is that they are startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And the living Christ, the formerly dead, now alive Jesus, says, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? This is a, this is a crazy account. They're, they're looking at the man and speaking with the man that they knew to be dead and is now alive, and they're struggling to believe it. What? He's he's looking at them and he's diagnosing their response as one of doubt. Which means the reason that it's hard to believe in the resurrection is not because it's not true. 
The reason it's hard to believe in the resurrection is not because there is no evidence. The resurrected man is there in all of his glorious evidence, and the people seeing it at the very first still are having trouble believing it. It it made more sense to them that they were looking at a ghost. They're going to believe ghost stories before they're going to believe that this dead man is now in front of them actually alive. The resurrection isn't just hard to believe if you're here this morning. The resurrection was hard to believe when you were eyeball to eyeball with Jesus. And the question I want to consider with you for a few minutes this morning is why? Why is that so hard to believe? Why could you be looking at a resurrected man and have doubts in your heart? Why could you be looking at a resurrected man and find it easier to believe that he's a spooky, scary ghost than that he has returned from the grave? Listen, You need to figure this out. You need to figure out why it's so hard to believe this because this difficulty in believing it is something that every single one of us must overcome. You got to figure out a way over this unbelief. I got to figure out a way through this unbelief. And as Jesus stands as the evidence of his resurrection, He seeks to persuade the disciples that actually what they're seeing is real and true and wonderful. And while he goes about explaining it, we get an understanding of why we don't believe it. And I want you to see three reasons why it's so hard for us to believe the resurrection. Here's the first reason. We don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we don't believe in facts. We don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus because we don't believe in facts. Jesus encounters these people who just, they doubt it. (laughs) They, They don't believe I think it's a ghost. I don't think it's him. They just don't believe it. And what he proceeds to do is to give them evidence. He presents to them facts. He speaks to them. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? There's a voice that you can hear. He He doesn't just call them to listen. He calls them to look. He says, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. He's like, look, here's the facts, guys. Listen up. Look. Look at me. And don't just look. Touch me. Touch me and see. He says, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone like you see that I have. He says, listen. He says, look. He says, touch. And then if all that were not enough, then he involves them with this this amazing story of the fish. He's like, I'm hungry. Anybody got anything to eat? And one of them has to pick up a fish and they have to hand it to this man and he takes it and he consumes it. And a fish that had been there is now in his belly. There's no smoke and mirrors. You can see this. This is a fact. It was just as hard for the people who were there to believe it as it is for you to believe it because we deny facts. We shouldn't. But that's what we do. The resurrection is an absolutely factual reality. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3, the apostle says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. Jesus keeps showing up. Jesus keeps walking into rooms. He keeps holding out his hands. He keeps eating meals in front of people. Hundreds of witnesses. This is one of the most well-attested facts in the ancient world. In 1 John, Chapter 1, starting in verse 1, the apostle says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we've seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. These are facts. This is information. But we don't believe it. Not because it's not true. We believe it because we live in a world where it is cool to separate reality from fact. You you know this. You see this. We live in a world where it is the order of the day to decide what you want to be true, and then you go find the people who are going to tell you what you want to hear. This is why there are news stations on television, competing news stations that report opposite facts. Because they're trying to get the audience. There's some news stations that are presenting the facts that one group of people want to hear. And there's other news stations that present facts that other people want to hear. The reality is we're living in a world that is breaking down and separating life from truth. And you can't do that. You can believe whatever you want to believe in one sense, but you are not entitled to dictate your own facts. Facts are facts, whether you'd like them to be or not. Facts are facts, whether they're convenient for you or not. Facts are facts, whether you like them or not. I live with people who love, now love, broccoli. (laughs) Listen, I can't understand that. That makes no sense to me. But I'm not going to call them a pack of liars. I talked with a a guy at a car wash here in town. I was talking with him. I was introducing myself, and I told him I was a pastor. And he said, oh, you're a pastor. What church do you pastor? And I said, well, First Baptist Jacksonville. And he goes, no. I, I, I would actually be wonderful. He's here today. Hello. <laughs> I said, oh, no, I, I, I pastor First Baptist Church in Jacksonville. And he said, no, they closed down. <laughs> and I said, well, we opened back up. <laughs> and he didn't believe me. <laughs> okay. And he walked away like I was a big liar. Listen, for a church that is closed down, it sure is hard to find a seat in this place. (laughs) Listen, you, you can believe what you'd like, but you can't be a wise person, be an honest person, and separate your beliefs from the facts. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're told about this world that we live in. It says there's a time coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, 
they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This is an indictment against anyone who would deny the facts of the resurrection. Hundreds of people witnessed Jesus alive. Many of those witnesses went to their deaths swearing it is true. It is more than enough to meet the demand of any court of justice in the land. It is true. If you don't believe it, it's not because it's not true. It's because we just don't like facts. There's a second reason why we don't believe the resurrection. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't like facts. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't believe God. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't believe God. As Jesus stands in front of these people alive, he says in verse 44, that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus says, what you're seeing, me alive, breathing, eating, able to be touched, able to touch you, what you are seeing, this is what God told you was happening in the law, in the prophets, and in the writings, that is, in the Old Testament. This was what was prophesied. This is what was told to you was going to happen. In the Gospel of John, chapter 46, uh, chapter 5, verse 46, if you believed Moses, Jesus says, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings... How will you believe my words? Jesus is talking about a consistent testimony from the Old Testament books in the Bible to what would become the New Testament books in the Bible. He says, Moses told you this was going to happen. And then Jesus comes and he says it. Moses says it. The prophets say it. The Psalms say it, and then Jesus comes and he says it in verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you. You see me standing up here in front of you? You see me eating fish? You see me alive after I was dead? This is what I told you. It's not just about listening to Moses in the Old Testament. It's about listening to Jesus in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 9, verse 35 a voice comes out of heaven saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Jesus speaks with the authority of the son of God. And he says, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem and they're gonna kill me, but on the third day, I'm gonna rise from the grave. And he says, guys, this is what I told you. You read about it in the Old Testament. I'm telling you about it now. And here's what is so important for you to understand on Easter Sunday. All of those words, whether from Moses, from the prophets, from the writings in the Old Testament, whether they're from Jesus himself or whether those words are from Jesus' apostles, all of those words are here recorded for us in the Bible. And let me tell you what the Bible is. The Bible is described in 2 Peter 1, verse 21. It says, No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This book, the Bible, is God's word. 
It's the speech of men, to be sure. Peter wrote what he wrote, and Paul wrote what he wrote, and Luke wrote what he wrote. But what, what the apostles tell us is that those human authors are merely instruments who did exactly what God wanted them to do, who spoke exactly in the way that God wanted them to speak, so that what we have in the Bible is God's word. And for anyone who doesn't believe the Bible, you need to know that God says the Bible is true. God says the Bible is my word. For anyone who doesn't believe that the resurrection is true, God says my son rose from the grave. And so you have to decide who are you going to believe? Is the basis of your belief going to be the limit of your own imagination? Well, I can't imagine a world where dead people come back from the grave, so I don't believe it. Or will you believe it when God says this is true? I, I want to call on you this morning to believe the word of God. To believe this word that comes from heaven through apostles and prophets, this word that has been standing, that has been preserved for thousands and thousands of years, that people all over the world has, have believed and thousands of years from now will still stand. When you are rotting in your grave, there's going to be somebody standing up preaching this word as true. Because it's God's word, and that word stands. And I want to call you to believe in this word that is bigger and better than you, that controls your reality, even though you might not understand it. You need to believe the resurrection because God said, my boy is alive. My son is alive. And compared to what you think about it, your view isn't all that important. What matters is what God says is true. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't believe facts. We like to make up our own reality. We don't believe the resurrection because we like ourselves to set the limits of what we are going to believe and not what God says. There's a third reason we don't believe the resurrection. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't have power. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't have power. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't believe facts. We don't believe the resurrection because we don't believe God. And we don't believe the resurrection because we don't have power. So for thousands of years the witnesses to the resurrection have stood. But so many don't believe it. Even big, fancy-pants scholars don't believe it. There might be some of you that don't believe it. And you say, well, you're talking about facts and you're talking about God's Word, but you got all that out of that Bible, and I just don't believe that stuff. Well, there are some things that you're just too weak to believe. There's some things that you just can't get your arms around and believe because you're just too weak. The last couple of weeks, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but the last couple of weeks, I have been trying to figure out Einstein's special theory of relativity. I've, I've read a couple of books about it. I've, I've watched a few documentaries about it. 
I've seen some of those uh, five-minute YouTube videos for dummies that explain it. And true confessions, I think I could stand up here and I think I could say some things about Einstein's special theory of relativity that would make you think I understand it, but I don't. I, I could say some things, I could say some words and string them together and you'd be like, well, the preacher knows about Einstein's special theory of relativity, but I don't. I don't. And, and it was about the middle of last week I was having trouble sleeping, and I was on YouTube, and I was watching this graphic, and I'm like, you know what? I give up. I just give up. I just can't understand this. Uh, Einstein, when he was interviewed many, many times through his life about the special theory of relativity, the joke was back in the day, back when he discovered it, that there were only three scientists in the world who could understand this mind-boggling theory that changed the way we think of space-time, the way light moves. I could say a few more things, but I'm not trying to. <laughs> I don't want to mislead you. There's this mind-blowing theory. Three people, it was said, understood it. And Einstein, whenever he was interviewed, he said, no, that's not true. Any person with sufficient scientific training can understand the special theory of relativity. And when I heard that he said that to reporters all across the world, it really helped me because I'm like, you know what? I just don't have the scientific training to understand it. So, so I'm happy to admit that the special theory of relativity is true, but I'm also happy to admit in all my humility in front of you that I just don't have the brains to figure it out. There's some things in this world that we can't figure out because we're weak. And if you're here this morning and you aren't believing the resurrection, it's not because it's not true. It's not because the facts aren't there. It's not because God didn't say it. It's because you're weak. Just like I can't understand the special theory of relativity without help, you can't understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ without help. It's just too big. It's just too category destroying. It's just too mind boggling. Do you know what it is that makes you weak? Ephesians chapter four, verse 18 tells us. It says, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. You know what that says? It says you and I, on our own, are fools. We're foolish people. On our own, in our own capacity, with the limits of our own imagination, we are fools. The Bible says sin makes us stupid. We can't see things the way they really are. The, the essence of sin in your life is not the list of bad things that you do. No, there's a list of bad things that you do. The essence of sin in your life is not the list of good things that you don't do, though that list is there. It's not the bad things you say or don't say. It's not uh, all of the bad things you think or want. The essence of sin in your life is that your heart is hard and you don't believe God and you reject his truth. And you are weak. The problem with your lack of belief in the resurrection is not a true resurrection that has been established in fact and declared by God. It's that your heart is hard. It's that sin makes your heart and your mind small and the glorious truth of the resurrection can't fit in it. This is why Jesus tells us back in Luke 24, verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. 
When you are confronted with the resurrection and you don't believe it, the thing to do is not say, I don't believe it. Like, that's an important thing. Or like your response to that fact matters with the truthfulness. I'm not going to stand up here and say, I don't believe in Einstein's special theory of relativity. You'd say, hey, buddy, just, you, you look bad here. Let's, let's just admit that relativity is bigger than you are and we don't need to deny facts. Confronted with a lack of belief in the resurrection, don't argue with the resurrection. Don't argue with the facts. Don't argue with God. Argue with your own heart and ask the Lord to forgive you for a small heart that won't believe glorious things. Ask the Lord to forgive you and give you grace to believe the wonder and the glory and the beauty and the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 45 of Luke 24 says that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Oh, my friends, if you're here this morning and you don't believe the resurrection, Jesus is alive and he is here too. And he has great power to open your minds where your mind has been closed and small and hard and resistant. A living Christ has power to open your minds. And for some of you, he's doing it right now. He's opening your minds so that you could say, it's true. It's true. Because Jesus is alive, we live in a world where dead men conquer the grave. You just need power to believe it. And the last verse of our passage talks about this power. Jesus says, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. In John chapter 16, verse 13, we're told what this power is. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, He, the Spirit of truth, when He comes, He will guide you into all truth. This is the power from on high that you need. This is the power from on high that the resurrected Christ is giving to you right now. You came in here this morning, you thought, I don't believe that dead people come back from the grave. And you're starting to go, wait, this is true. Wait, this is something that God says. How is that happening? It's happening because Jesus Christ is alive and he has a powerful spirit that he gives to open your mind to teach you that the scriptures are true. One of the best, one of the best phrases in this whole account is at the very beginning when Jesus is showing them his hands and he's showing them his side and he's eating in front of them. In verse 41, it says, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling. He says, well, they still disbelieved for joy. They were marveling. This is very important because it teaches that there's actually two kinds of disbelief. One kind of disbelief is the kind I've been talking about. It's angry, suspicious disbelief. I don't believe that. I don't believe dead people come back from the grave. I'm smart. A historical fact that involves a resurrection from the dead is utterly inconceivable. I don't need to go to church on Easter. I'll go because mom asked. I'll go because there's lunch afterwards. But I don't believe that. That's one kind of belief. That's the kind of belief I've been talking about. But this says there's another kind of disbelief. There is a disbelief for joy. It's the kind of disbelief that you experience on Christmas morning when you open the gift and it's what you wanted. And you go, I can't believe it. It's, it's the kind of disbelief you experience when you heard 
heard that the medical diagnosis was terminal, and then they came back and they said, she's going to make it. And you go, I can't believe it. It's not the disbelief of rejection. It's the disbelief of joy where you just are having difficulty fathoming that life could be this wonderful. Listen, I want you this morning to turn from angry disbelief to the disbelief of joy. You can believe today that life really is better than you ever thought it would be. Your life is not headed inextricably towards that high, thick wall of death from which there is no return because Jesus is alive. He conquered death and through him, with him, by him, you can conquer it too. Your life is not some on some horrible slide to get worse and worse and worse until you die and it's all over. One day, your life, when you trust in Jesus, will issue into eternal joy and peace and love and glory because Jesus is alive. It's true. God said it's true. Won't you believe today? Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes open our minds, open our hearts to believe the scriptures and to see that it's all true, to trust you and to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen.